I've been picking up dead animals to the point where I can't even do it anymore. The air yesterday was so bad, the alarm was going off. These are one of the many incidents documented near frac sites. The animal symptoms correspond with known effects from chemicals used in fracking. This kitten seems to have some serious nerve damage going on here. Infertility, cancer and birth defects. New studies have added to the list of the health effects of fracking. Toxicologists examine just a third of the 900 chemicals they pump in the water, ground and air. Four in ten chemicals were found to hit kidney and immune systems. A majority affected the nervous system and blood. And two in three of the chemicals damaged the skin, eyes and other sensory organs. Wells are now even being drilled, reports CNN, inside schools. Two gas wells in Leroy High School, New York, spilled, killing the trees and vegetation where students play right there every day. By March, reports the New York Times, 18 children at the school had come down with Tourette's syndrome, a neurological disease with symptoms similar to the kittens found at frac sites. The National Atmospheric Agency found small towns with frac sites like Erie, Colorado, now have air pollution nine times higher than America's dirtiest cities that don't yet have drilling. Richard Cheney used to run oil giant Halliburton, as vice president, he pushed through Congress breathtaking legislation called the Halliburton Loophole. Freckers are now exempt from the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, Resource Conservation Act, Environmental Policy Act, Environmental Liability Act, the Community Right to Know Act, and most other federal laws on environmental health. The Marcellus Shale sits under the largest unfiltered water supply in the world. It provides tap water to millions on the East Coast. Authorities admit fracking's already affected the Allegheny River running through New York and Pennsylvania that supplies cities with their drinking water. The process has been used over 1.2 million times across the United States with zero evidence of water contamination. In fact, systematic and massive water, land and air contamination by fracking is admitted even in the industry's own documents. The process has been used over 1.2 million times across the United States with zero evidence of water contamination. River catches fire near fracking site. A river of bubbling with methane gas has been filmed bursting into flames with a spark from a kitchen lighter. Video of the Condamine River set alight was posted online by New South Wales Green Party MP Jeremy Buckingham. Buckingham blamed nearby fracking operations for the leak of methane gas into the river. In a potentially criminal suppression of massive health risks to the public, leaked reports by the world's biggest frac firm, Schlumberger, admit half the casings on frac wells fail, sending chemicals straight into the atmosphere. In fact, there's thousands and thousands of documented cases of fracking turning drinking water black, families with sudden symptoms of exposure to industrial chemicals. The hydrogen chloric acid is what they use before they frack, but that was the number one thing in my lungs. Rivers at frack sites floating with dead animals on and on. Parents were shocked to discover oil giants now work with Disney to brainwash the next generation. Oil and gas lobbies have paid Disney DJs and schools to take elementary class children out of class and make fracking infrastructure models while pop music blares in the background and Disney employees cheer them on. An industry spokesman admitted they target seven-year-olds because they take in information and don't ask annoying questions about health threats like those meddling adults. Kids are the best way to spread the message about the oil and gas industry. They retain the information. They remember it. Meet Talisman Terry, your friendly fracasaurus, a 24-page coloring book from the industry, which claims the environment is even better after it's been fracked. 
Comedy Central host Stephen Colbert adds a sick Terry setting fire to himself from his fracked water supply would be more realistic. It's all part of industry moves, notes author Daisy Luther, to make sure the next generation will never ask questions about deadly toxins in their adult life. I mean, why would you want to give up crop dusting? Blue skies, no air traffic. And A crop duster spraying poisonous chemicals on food is the hero of Disney's new blockbuster for children. In a supreme irony, the day the film was released, Activist Post reports 79 teens were rushed to ER after the Monsanto field they were working in was sprayed with toxic pesticides by a crop dust. Cracking the Eagle Ford Shale Big Oil and Bad Air on the Texas Prairie. It's the result of an eight-month investigation by Inside Climate News, the Center for Public Integrity, and the Weather Channel. Now a new investigation shedding light Looking through air permits and looking at the regulatory regime, we found that there are all of these facilities, that the wells and compressor stations and all the infrastructure that comes with the boom that are emitting industrial-sized air pollutants into the air. And you're talking about things like hydrogen sulfide, which can be deadly, uh, volatile organic compounds like benzene that can cause cancer in the long term. And you have that alongside many, many hundreds of residential complaints about things that are related to the industry. So you have residents complaining to regulators about headaches and uh, foul odors and trouble breathing and all kinds of respiratory problems. And at the same time, you have a regulatory system that knows very little about the air quality in the area because they have only five permanent air monitors in the entire Eagle Ford. And none of these monitors are in places with a lot of drilling. Mm. Also, you have regulatory agencies that are very business friendly and very closely intertwined with the oil and gas industry. These folks who once lived in a rural area are now finding themselves with dozens of wells and processing plants surrounding them. They have very few places to turn for help. They, uh, they have two, two regulatory agencies in Texas. The primary agency is the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. And this, this is a, an agency that has commissioners appointed by the governor of Texas, Rick Perry, who has uh, made it publicly known that he'd like to dismantle the EPA. Um, his attorney general um, has sued the EPA more than a dozen times. So the folks in Texas feel that they are somewhat disenfranchised in that they have very, very uh, few people who are on their side who can champion their cause. These, these are truly the, the little people trying to fight government and trying to fight big business. You see, I saw this in Nigeria, in the Niger Delta. At the time, it wasn't even allowed in the United States and the people and watching your video uh, complaining of feeling like an elephant is on their chest as they breathe in the soot from this this flame. Uh, I'd ask, what the frack is Mickey Mouse up to in Ohio? See last month Radio Disney employees traveled to 26 schools and science centers across the state promoting a program called Rockin in Ohio. Sounds innocent enough, right? Well, turns out this initiative was entirely funded by none other than the Ohio Oil and Gas Energy Education Program, which in turn gets its money from, you guessed it, oil and gas companies. But I doubt these kids were also taught that infertility and cancer-causing chemicals have been found in fracking water supplies, and that the practice is responsible for artificial earthquakes in Youngstown, Ohio. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, the fracking indoctrination of Ohio's youth isn't sitting too well with environmental activists. In fact, one online petition urging Disney's CEO to shut down this program has already gathered over 80,000 signatures. Ever wonder why most Americans have a fascination with chemicals? It's in the water. Take a whiff. What does it smell like? The average person gets over five times the safe amount of fluoride in their water each day. Fluoride is related to the 
7 to 9% decrease in IQ levels. There is a seven-fold increase in cancer rates in communities that have fluoride in their water. Fluoride is a t toxic waste byproduct, often imported from Japan and China to be used in Americans' water. Hitler used fluoride in the prison camps to make the prison inmates more passive. Why would anyone want fluoride in their water? Radioactive tritium is leaking from three quarters of all U.S. commercial nuclear power sites. The cancer-causing material often seeps into groundwater from corroded, buried piping. That's what the Associated Press concluded after a year-long investigation. The policy that's in place right now is leak first, fix later. And that compromises the public health and safety, and it also violates the conditions to which these plants were originally licensed. Beyond nuclears, Paul Gunter says the number and severity of the leaks has been escalating, even as federal regulators extend the licenses of more and more reactors across the nation. Tritium is a radioactive form of hydrogen. In many cases, the radioactive leaks have far exceeded the federal drinking water standard. But so far, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and industry says the leaks are not a threat to public health. However, the National Academy of Sciences and other experts disagree and say any exposure to radioactivity boosts the risk of cancer. It's very effective in damaging things like DNA uh, or cell development. The tritium leaks have also spurred doubts among independent engineers about the reliability of emergency safety systems at the 104 nuclear reactors situated on 65 different sites. Very quickly, the German government has taken the right decision. You cannot guarantee nuclear safety. Nuclear industry was already on its last legs before Fukushima. This is really going to be the end, but it's going to take a long time. Sean Burney, thanks so much for that. Good to hear what you have to say. Joining us live there in the UK. Oh, God. Here we go. Ah, uh, let's see here. Carbonated water, citric acid, potassium citrate, natural flavor, and aspartame. Uh, what? Hang on. Holy shit. That's it. Our exposure to free aluminum results from numerous industrial and household uses of the metal. It produces a fluor aluminum compound that was infinitely more toxic than the fluoride alone or by itself. In fact, it damages the small blood vessels that feed the brain that's so critical to brain function in very small doses, far less than the amount of fluoride added to the, the drinking water. Uh, has been shown to produce this severe damage to the microvessels of the brain when combined with aluminum. And remember, drinking water it has aluminum added to it. So you can see all the plastic here, and including this, like the rivers throw the plastic into the water, the water brings it back to the shore. Um, red is pollution, green is the uh, habitat destruction slash fragmentation, purple is over harvesting. And the blue is invasive species, and these are means plus or minus standard errors from the several years that we've been doing this. And uh, again, ranking with one being uh, the greatest threat, and then four being the uh, the lowest threat. And actually, sometimes a couple of, there's a couple of weird things there with temperature. A, a couple of questions we asked about fisheries, we've asked a, a couple of additional things like ocean temperature and and uh, warm um, ocean acidification. So that's all those extra two dots over there. So sometimes when we do this, we use a six point scale, but that's why it goes beyond four. But for the most part, the stuff that we talked about, that you guys pulled about, uh, we focus a lot on this coastal question. And so invariably, and we've seen this from the 70s on, invariably when we ask Joe, Bo, Joe Blow in the public, what are the greatest threats? Pollution is always what everybody thinks. And not only is it pollution, but it's pollution by a far margin, right? So everything else tends to be much closer clumped together. 
you know, pollution out here, these other things are together. Uh, pollution out here, in this case, fragmentation is kind of close with the wetlands, but everything else is down here. When we ask about the general perceived threats to the coastal zone, this is what people identify, pollution, and then everything else. I think plastics are one of the easiest things to talk about when we talk about coastal and marine pollution because we can actually physically see it. We don't necessarily need a chemical test. We don't necessarily need a sensor. We can actually just see it. So for that reason, I think it's a, it's a nice subject to talk about um, uh, pollution. So this is one of the areas where they are concentrated. In addition to plastics, the, the, the large plastics that you and I can easily see from afar, um, we've increasingly come to realize that a large part of the story is actually the smaller uh, particulate pieces of plastic. So we generally refer to those as microplastics. That, that, those are plastic items that are less than um, five millimeters in maximum dimension and oftentimes can be significantly smaller than that. And these images are just showing some of the examples of stuff that we get. Some of the really, really small stuff, this is a scanning electron micro, uh, micrograph of um, our uh, micro beads, which are machined pieces of plastic to be a consistent size. So these are not pieces that were part of a much larger item that have broken down. These are actually items that were machined and, and created to be a specific size, generally to have some type of abrasion type of a quality. So you see a lot of these in facial care and skin, um, in um, what do I say, like, like skin soaps, you know, scrubbers and stuff like that, toothpastes, stuff like that. And um, in the state of California, we're in the phase, we're in the um, process of phasing these out of personal care products. But um, but plastics span a whole range of intentionally designed and unintentionally designed structures. This, th these materials have gotten into a whole suite of our, um, you know, all these nooks and crannies of our ecosystem. This picture on the left is a picture from uh, the 90s that my friend took when they were out on a, a, what's called a Cal Coffee cruise, a cruise off the coast of California. And this rainbow runner was just some random rainbow runner and she took her knife and sliced open the belly and all of this plastic just came pouring out. The greater the concentration of microplastics and what you can see is um, as they got to the center of these different uh, gyres, you see that there's, they're obviously getting more um, debris per unit, air, per unit surface area of the ocean or unit volume of the water. Deep water coral and deep water sediments from you know, sites that are you know, north and, you know, north of, way north of Europe, you know, south of Madagascar, down towards Antarctica, and we find this stuff just about everywhere. Every site we've sampled, we've found some pieces of plastic. So we find it on all the beaches, down at the bottom of the ocean we're finding it everywhere, right? And here's some examples of where we're finding this stuff. 2,000 meters down, 300 meters down, 1,000 meters down on seamounts, on can in canyons, you know, all this stuff. It is everywhere. So the very first time we did this and we took one of these, it wasn't, it wasn't even really a first full test, this was just a trial. We grabbed a sand crab, was that super funny? I grew, grabbed a sand crab, and we put her in a container with some of these pieces of plastic in an air in an air stone just for a few hours right just to see if what would happen and actually left it for 24 hours and then cut her open and there was this first one there was 94 pieces of plastic this is in, this is she's cut open here and so this is like her gut but 94 pieces inside of her digestive tract holy cow and so then we said oh hey let's let's uh we ran some controls as well, just to make sure there weren't all this, in this purple stuff floating around. And we cut open the controls, crabs that we did not, that we held in a similar container that did not, you know, expose them to this, these, these purple beads. Um, we cut them open, and yes, there were no purple beads in that one. That's great. But they all had plastic in them. They had plastic because they were eating it from the wild where we got them from. So it's crazy. So, um, yeah. The more we look, the more we find these substances in different uh, entering different aspects of the food chain. Um, this is this is uh, one that I like. This was um, a study done where these guys went to um, fish markets. So all they did was go to places where you could buy fish. 
So they went to Indonesia and they went to some places here in California and they just got straight up raw fish. So um, not fillets of fish, but the raw whole fish. Took the fish back to the lab, cut them open, took their guts out, just like I showed you with that rainbow runner, and just said, hey, do these guys have any plastics in them? And this is what we see. So this is, um, long story short, there are, there's, let's see. So this is, what the heck is this? This is pieces of trash. Um, and then this is pieces of plastic. And these are these are these are chunks. So this was this was presumably part of a larger item, say a plastic cup, a PVC pipe that broke down. So it's a it's a it's a broken shard you might think of it as. And then plastic fibers again are those microfibers are those things that primarily come from clothes. And what we see is and we're seeing this pattern in our um, our sand as well. In uh, the developing world, we 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 have a relatively high proportion of plastic pieces. In the developing world, the developed world, where we have a lot of sewage treatment plants and, and properly treat our waste on average fairly well, um, we see a, a, a higher proportion of fibers. So it appears to be clear. And some of you guys are doing this work for your capstone and stuff. But but the short version appears to be that our cleaning systems, our water cleaning systems, cannot handle microfiber. Another part of the spectrum of pollution are items that we actually create because we know they're straight up toxic. We've created them to be as dangerous as possible, if you will. And so that would be um, a classic example. Of that would be something like marine paint. So we have fouling critters. As you guys know, anything we put in the ocean, things will start growing on. Algae, barnacles, you know, all these organisms will start growing. In a little bit, not a big deal. But um, eventually we can get not just fouling organisms or, or critters growing on the surface of, a, of an item in the water. We can actually get critters that, and that's problematic. We can imagine if we're a boat and we want a nice smooth boat hull, we want to be able to cut through the water and, uh, and go fast. And we have stuff sticking off the, back of, off the side of our hull. It's going to slow down. It's going to create drag. And we're going to have to spend more energy to push our, our boat through the water. But then also we can have critters that actually eat into the structure of our vessel. Boring organisms, clams and the like that actually sponges, that actually drill into and actually weaken and, and essentially rot away our wood or, or other boat structures. So because of that, um, one of the responses is, hey, let's put some substances, let's coat those items that we put in the water with something that will not allow those things to, to do that. And so we see all these things, all these um, uh, toxic substances. And if we look at um, bottom paints in particular, if we, if we scroll down, I'll just read this uh, ad from the uh, 60s. So Z-Spar, which is um, a brand, Z-Spar Research delivers the latest, most powerful toxic agents obtainable. New developments include improved poison power in every bottom paint and a new formulation of color talks for racing sailors. Now you can have a gleaming white or brightly colored bottom plus effective anti-fouling power. So again, we, ha we have a range of, of things that are potential pollution sources, some unintended, others straight up uh, dangerous. And you know we, we can go through, but these substances are really crazy. The, most, uh, the lowest hanging fruit, the, the, the most obvious tox one, is this guy here on the right, tributyl tin, or TBT is what people oftentimes will abbreviate it as. And that substance is particularly toxic. <clears throat> so right now we're floating microplastics in a hypersaline solution. And then we're running it through a filter and we are seeing how much microplastics and fibers there are going to be in each one of these sand samples that we grabbed from the beaches. Okay, so here's our glass slide, and you can see the dimple on top of the slide right there. We'll take our solution of microbeads with a pipette. Get a good dose of that there, and just gently squeeze that into the dimple. You don't want to use too much, or else uh, you won't get... Uh, 
you'll get flow of the beads as they move through the fluid and you don't want that. So we then take our cover slip, lay it down, and then gently just push him into place. And then we can soak up the residue. And we're good to go. Just place that on a microscope and take a look at the motion. Okay, so we put our slide into the microscope and adjust the focus of it, and there's our beads. That's all those little tiny dots you see there in the image. Uh, there's some other junk in there. I think it's bits of paper and stuff that I used to wipe off the slide with. Uh, but we don't care about that. What we care about are those tiny little dots. Now, right now, we can't really see anything because we're using a very low magnification. If we increase the magnification by selecting a different objective and readjusting our focus, we'll see, ah, there are our beads. And uh, they're still very small, but we can actually see how we can change the focus and look at different depth levels inside that drop of fluid. Uh, but let's increase the magnification a bit more to actually see some Brownian motion. And there we go. So I adjust my magnification. I can see my little drops and they're all jiggling around. And that jiggling around that you see is Brownian motion. So now your job is to pick a good candidate bead to trace its motion and measure how far it travels in given lengths of time and to do the mathematics that we need. Uh, and it's very important that you choose a good bead. A good bead is going to be one that is isolated, that's not stuck to uh, neighboring beads, uh, that stays within your field of view for the required length of your measurement. Um, also, it has to be a bead that's exhibiting Brownian motion, not flow. We'll discuss that in a moment. Uh, here we have a bead, look there, and you'll see a couple of beads that are actually stuck together. We don't want those. Uh, they're two beads together. We want to look at an individual bead. Um, something more like, say, that guy right there. Another thing to be concerned about is we don't want beads that are stuck. Let's see if we can find an example of that. Uh, yeah, I think that guy right there, um, he, we've now moved the focus to where we're looking at actually the surface of the slide. And what can happen is the bead will actually get stuck to the surface of the slide. And when it's stuck, it's not going to be exhibiting Brownian motion. So we want to make sure we're looking uh, into, in the middle of the fluid column, and that those beads are actually are moving around nicely. And then we'll have a good candidate for measuring uh, the Brownian motion inside the fluid. So look for a single solitary bead that's not stuck to the surface, uh, that's not sitting next to a bunch of junk in there, and follow its motion and we're good. Okay, now here's an example of a mistake. This slide was not properly prepared so that we're actually getting flow of fluid on the surface of the slide. Hence, we're not getting Brownian motion, we're just getting straight forward sideways, sideways motion of the beads. You do not want this. If you are seeing this kind of motion, uh, first wait for it to settle down. If it doesn't, you'll need to remount the slide. Uh, we need them jiggling around largely in place if they're moving in a particular direction, that is not Brownian motion. Alpha lipoic acid is a very important antioxidant. If you're going to take calcium, I'd recommend taking calcium pyruvate because the pyruvate helps block excitotoxicity and the calcium will help reduce the toxicity of the aluminum. Recently, what's been discovered is that saffron the extract, which you can get as a supplement, saffron, is very good at binding and neutralizing the toxicity of aluminum, particularly in the brain. And curcumin also binds aluminum and reduces its toxicity, again, uh, very well inside of the brain because cur curcumin enters the brain very easily. And it's been found that curcumin 
tends to focus its concentration in the brain on the areas of the brain most damaged by uh, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. Magnesium is important. I would use the magnesium malate, the, the time release. As you raise your tissue magnesium levels, that significantly reduces the toxicity of aluminum. So I hope you've gotten some useful information.